Hey everyone, um, thanks for coming. Uh, good morning. Um, today I'll be talking about Drupal Defense in Depth, uh, which is a security framework for Drupal at scale. Um, we've got a few items on the agenda today. We're going to start out with some introductions. Uh, we'll step through the five key phases of the NIST cybersecurity framework, and then we'll just look at summarizing and uh, next steps. Uh, to start with, um, who am I? Um, I'm Ming. I'm a DevOps engineer with Salsa Digital. Um, I've been working with uh, governments and enterprise Drupal deployments since about 2020, um, mostly using Amazie's um, Lagoon uh, SH platform. Uh, some notable projects I've worked on include uh, the Victorian government's single digital presence, uh, I've done a little bit of work for GovCMS, um, and I also work on Salsa's internal hosting platform called Salsa Hosting. So before we get into it, um, we need to go through a couple of concepts. So the first of which is defense in depth. Uh, what is defense in depth? Um, it's a layered approach to security, um, and traditionally this would compose of physical, technical, and administrative controls. Um, but as we know, with the move to cloud computing, uh, the physical security layer is often taken off, uh, taken care of uh, by the cloud provider. And it's not something that people in Drupal DevOps generally have to be concerned about when managing the security of our Drupal sites. Um, so we'll really just be covering the technical and administrative uh, controls here. Um, Salsa's defense and depth strategy consists of seven layers uh, going from bottom up. We've got infrastructure, container hosting, application, edge protection, content delivery, people, and process. Um, for this presentation, um, just to keep within time, we'll be focusing mainly on infrastructure, container hosting, application, people, and process. Um, this is because organizations uh, usually directly control these elements of the hosting stack. Um, our strategy is also built around a more containerized hosting stack using Kubernetes. Uh, secondly, what is the NIST cybersecurity framework? Um, it is a highly respected and adopted cybersecurity framework in the United States. Uh, unlike a lot of other frameworks, it's not a certifiable technical standard, um, but it's highly flexible and it can be adapted to a wide variety of technical stacks um, and unique threat landscapes. Uh, it contains the five key phases we covered earlier, identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. So what's our strategy here? How are these two concepts related? Uh, for one, um, Defense in depth is an effective strategy to contain many attacks. Um, if attackers manage to compromise a single defense, uh, the effective blast radius of their attack or exploit will be limited by the other layers of protection. Uh, and secondly, uh, the NIST framework is, um, acts as a stepping stone uh, to begin a journey to more stringent certifications. Many of the practices and recommendations from the NIST framework are echoed in these stricter standards. So aligning a defense in depth strategy with the NIST cybersecurity framework fortifies the layers of a defense strategy, while also helping to streamline the path to compliance for more advanced security standards like ISO or PCI. So starting off with the first phase of the cybersecurity framework, um, identify how can we apply it to our defense, defense in depth strategy layers. Um, this involves identifying assets that may be at risk. Um, so for, for our infrastructure, uh, some infrastructure components um, that might be targeted include computing infrastructure such as web servers and worker nodes, in addition to networking components such as load balances. Application. The vast majority of vulnerabilities in Drupal sites come from contrib modules, themes, and libraries. It's important to keep track of those that are in use and monitor the Drupal security advisories for disclosed vulnerabilities. Container hosting, part of your container hosting uh, or orchestration infrastructure that might be particularly exposed include things like the Kubernetes API server, as well as components of any observability stack in use like Grafana or OpenSearch dashboards. Uh, other cluster management APIs in use should be considered. 
For example, the Lagoon API uh, for clusters managed by amazingslagoon.sh is also exposed publicly. People. Uh, with the level of sophistication of phishing and spear phishing attacks these days, um, as you know, personnel are often the weakest link in their cybersecurity strategy. Uh, and finally, process. Although process isn't something tangible that an attacker can target directly, outdated processes are a risk that could negatively impact the implementation of later stages of our framework. Protect. Um, how do we protect our assets? Um, we need to have a comprehensive security strategy for each element of our technical stack. Um, so starting out with infrastructure, um, since we're most likely in the cloud, we want to leverage cloud provider concepts, for example. Uh, we want to make effective use of things like network policies and security groups. Uh, we want to rely on things like cloud provider managed um, operating system images because these are often configured with best practice in mind. Um, we also want to look at things like regular rotation of our worker nodes to ensure that the operating system is up to date. Um, this can be done manually or via something, a tool like Carpenter, where you can actually schedule um, your worker nodes to have a finite lifespan, um, and then they'll be removed and replaced with a more up to date version. Application. Um, we want to, for Drupal, we want to have uh, strategies like configuration management and auditing. Uh, to ensure that configuration is in line with your security policies. Um, at Salsa, we have a tool called ShipShape, which is free and open source that we use um, on client sites to ensure that any code being deployed um, has configuration that's in line with their policies. Uh, regular and automatic patch management for core and contrib. Um, you want to have um, regular um, and automatic patch management for your sites to ensure that any security vulnerabilities, of course, patched out. Um, Although Drupal has very good security, um, we can extend that with things like security modules, password policy, username enumeration prevention, login security, the TFA module. These provide a host of additional security uh, features for Drupal. Um, and of course, um, if possible, we want to rely, um, we want to switch to static content. So if your Drupal site is not too dynamic, you can host a static version of it. Um, and we can use tools like, you know, Tome and Quant CDN, um, which would vastly reduce the attack surface of your application if it's just a static representation. Container hosting. Uh, we can put things like our API server uh, on a private network so it's only accessible, accessible via VPN. Same for Grafana and logging dashboards, for example. You can use an IPS to detect connections to certain block listed addresses, protocols, and domains. Um, and you can protect your point of ingress. So for example, you can apply um, mod security right on your ingress controller. So no matter how someone gets to your site, it's being protected by a WAF. Uh, people, um, you want to have things like proactive security training, uh, role-based access control according to someone's job function. Uh, Drupal has a very robust access control system with roles and modular permissions. You want to do things like uh, mandate the use of password managers and two-factor authentication across the board. And of course, um, your process, you need to instate a security policy that enforces all these standards uh, we've listed above from you know, your application configuration to network policies to user access. Uh, detect, how can we detect a breach or if someone's attempting to um, abuse our cloud infrastructure? Um, so to start with, at the infrastructure level, um, if your cloud use is fairly stable, uh, cost and usage alerts, uh, for example, are a useful identifier to determine if there's been a breach, especially if attackers um, you know, use the access to try and spin up uh, a cryptocurrency miner, for example, that would really spike your cloud bill. Um, there are also tools such as Amazon Guard Duty, which can proactively monitor your instances and outgoing traffic to identify any breaches or potential breaches. Um, at the Drupal level, you can implement uh, things like the login security and the security kit module. Um, so Drupal has pretty robust protection against brute forcing um, of accounts. Um, but if someone is attempting to brute force multiple accounts, for example, on your site, um, the login security module can actually detect that and alert you proactively. Um, and with the security kit module for browser security, um, if someone has managed to compromise an account on your site, they often try to embed their own content, their own images, scripts, and iframes. 
uh, with the security kit module, you can um, configure a content security policy um, so that if someone attempts to access a page on your site that has malicious content, um, it, it won't load, the browser will refuse to load it. Um, and you can even specify a reporting endpoints. So if someone's browser has encountered content on your site that's against the security policy, it can actually report that to you. So you know that, you know, there's some stuff on a page on my site that's against my policy. Uh, container hosting. Um, at that level, we want to have things like centralized application logging and monitoring uh, so that logs from Drupal and PHP um, are aggregated and stored in one place. This allows your operations and support team to create alerts, monitor for events that might indicate a potential issue or a breach. Um, another advantage of this is that an attacker would be unable to tamper with any of your collected logs, even if they've completely breached your application, um, assuming they've gained code execution, they wouldn't be able to touch your log and you'd still be able to build a trail of where they've been. Uh, people, um, your content authors should be trained to spot out unusual or suspicious content or activity on the instance and actually be encouraged to report it. Um, employees should, of course, be actively looking out for phishing threats sent to their emails and be proactive about reporting those as well. Um, and most importantly, your process. Um, you want to have automatic alerting and proactive detection in place. You can achieve this through things like an IPS um, or Prometheus alerting rule. So if you know that's something you have to watch out for, you can create rules for these so that your team is notified ahead of time of any potentially suspicious activity. Uh, next phase, respond. So there's a famous saying I like, um, it's not when you get hacked, sorry, it's not if you get hacked, it's when. So we need to have a strategy in place to, res uh, to respond to breaches. So at our infrastructure level, for example, um, we could, in the event of a DDoS attack, we could do things by, you know, we could, for example, create a security group on our load balancer to drop incoming attack traffic. Uh, this is as opposed to you know, blocking the traffic at a container hosting or web server level um, via like an Nginx or an ingress rule. Uh, this is so that we can leverage the filtering that's performed at the cloud provider level to help alleviate pressure on our origin infrastructure. For our Drupal application, um, most of the time, unfortunately, the only immediate response that we can take once our application is breached is to just take it offline. Um, however, if you've actually taken a static snapshot of your site beforehand, it can serve as a good fallback. Um, although if your site is very dynamic, the functionality may be reduced, but um, your site will continue to be accessible in some capacity as opposed to completely offline. Um, at this point as well, you'd want to look at re uh, initiating the restoration of backups while your static snapshot uh, keeps your site online. At the container hosting level, um, you've got things, of course, like version control and container images, which are immutable. So that you know, this means that your deployment, no matter how you know, badly damaged it is, it can be instantly restored to a known good state. Um, I mean, it's important to note that at this point, your site's still vulnerable. It's not patched yet, but it can be very quickly reverted to you know, um, the last version, known good state. Uh, we can also make use of our centrally collected logs and metrics to perform a root cause analysis. People should have clearly defined roles and responsibilities. Um, and all your documented and hopefully practiced disaster recovery plans should be executed at this point. Uh, recovering from a breach. Uh, at the infrastructure level, we want to look at things like recycling nodes, for example. Um, although containerization should have actually protected our host node, there's still the risk of container breakout. Um, and recycling will instantly return all your worker nodes to their original condition. Of course, before we can put our application, our Drupal application back online, we need to ensure it's patched and updated so it doesn't just get breached again. We can use information that we've derived earlier from our root cause analysis um, using our collected logs and metrics to do this. Um, and once that's done, once it's patched, we can bring it back online or cut over from our static version. Uh, at the container hosting level, um, it would provide uh, backups using your chosen platform backup solution. One example of this is something called Kit Up. Um, these backups are completely decoupled from your application, stored off-site, encrypted, 
um, to ensure integrity. So if someone's breached the hosting environment for your Drupal site, they can't touch your backups. They're completely separate people. Um, your staff should be clearly informed about the cause of any breach so that they understand why and what they can do better next time. And of course, uh, at the process level, we should update our plans and processes like our DR plans to identify any, to address any weaknesses that, you know, may have been identified during this whole process. So those are the five key phases of the NIST framework. Um, let's step through an example scenario. How would, um, how would this have held up in the case of uh, CVE 2018-7600? Some of you might know this. Um, it's a Drupal Gen 2 vulnerability. Um, how would this have protected us in the case of a mass exploitable vulnerability uh, like Drupal Gen 2? Uh, let's explore the process a potential attacker would have taken in it uh, to attempt to compromise a Drupal site that was vulnerable to this exploit. Uh, first off, you know, um, they would have checked to see whether the site was vulnerable in the first place uh, by attempting to perform a command injection. Um, they would run the exploit and force the Drupal site to run something like the who am I command. Uh, a WEF product such as Mod Security um, or Quant WEF deployed at the edge or at our ingress controller would have easily picked up and blocked the request as command injection is a, is a very common attack type that these WEFs actually check for and block. Uh, secondly, let's say that day Mod Security decided to go on leave and it wasn't working. Um, and let's say the application, the attacker's command injection exploit went through unchecked. The next step might be um, to, say, set up a reverse shell uh, to attempt to gain access to the site's environment. Uh, this is often done on an arbitrary port, you know, something like 4444 or 7777. And IPS solutions such as um, Falco by Sysdig, um, deployed at your container hosting level, um, would have detected you know, an anomalous outbound connection. Why is Drupal um, trying to talk to something other than AT and 443? Um, that's quite suspicious. It would be able to block that and potentially alert your team as well. And finally, let's say all our technical protections were on snooze that day. None of them were working. Um, assuming the processes we discussed earlier were in place, uh, operation staff would have been alerted to the fact that a new vulnerability was in the world. Uh, and sites should be patched and defenses tweaked to mitigate the vulnerability. Uh, if any hosted sites had been compromised at that point, centralized logging would have allowed you to investigate and pick up on that very easily. For example, you could create a, an alert rule that scans incoming traffic um, for that pattern, um, the exploit pattern, and be alerted on it proactively. So as is Levis, um, to summarize, uh, the NIST framework is a really great security tool. We've walked through the five steps in the framework and applying the defense in depth layers to them. Uh, this provides an, effective, an effect, uh, provides an effective defense strategy while being in compliance with a well-respected security framework. Um, and what's next? Um, it's time to start defending your Drupal sites. I hope this gave you something to think about. Um, does anyone have any questions? Thank you for the presentation. Um, just a quick question: Should we include reporting as part of the process? So, in case, like you know, huge government agency site or sites mm -hmm. which have you know personal information and stuff like that, you know, thousands of customers, for example, and assuming that for some reason it's vulnerable and got hacked, yeah. um, as part of that process, should we include reporting to I mean, government agency or is there you know something yeah, we should report to? Um, yeah, if your site, um, if one of the hosted sites has been breached, you're often legally um, obligated to actually report that breach to your, your client or a government agency. It, it depends um, on your actual location, um, but yeah, you're often obligated to. Uh, do you have a list of top three Drupal modules that you always install for security or security oriented um, modules? Yeah, uh, yeah, so my top three are the security kit module, um, the login security module, and username enumeration prevention. 
Um, I also have a module on Drupal.org called Security Pack, which um, pulls in a bunch of um, popular security modules and installs some pre-done configuration for you. Um, so I think that's a you know a good like one-click solution to helping secure your Drupal site. Thing does things like you know enforces a stronger password policy, installs username enumeration prevention, sets up some brute force protection. Uh, thanks for the presentations. I have a question um, just here. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Um, I have a quick question about the uh, snack job or backup. Yeah. Uh, if in a situation, a size a compromise, but in a short period of time, we just have no idea where's gone wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, normally, we roll back to previous uh, snapshot or backup yeah. f f from, let's say, yesterday. But we realize uh, on local testing, we realize it's still not working. The compromise happened way before yesterday. Do yeah. we have the uh, capability to compare the snapshot backup uh, to, uh, to try to identify where the issues come from? Yeah, so in that case, if your site's actually been compromised for some point, that does make things more difficult. Um, but you'd have to identify the point um, at which your site was initially compromised. So that's where those um, collected logs and metrics um, you know, come really handy. You could find the, the pattern uh, or the account that got exploited, look at login requests, look at general HTTP requests, um, write up a query to actually find those and find the oldest match and any snapshot before that um, should be good. Um, but that, that also you know, plays into things like how long are you re retaining backups for? So you could be in trouble if your site's been actively compromised for six months and you're only holding three months of backups. Um, that would be a, an un quite a bad situation.